Merci beaucoup d'être venu. Thank you very much for coming to this first uh, seminar organized by the, by the chair in um, energy sector management. I'm Pierre Olivier Pinault, uh, and it's my pleasure today to introduce Afzal Siddiqui, who's a senior lecturer at the uh, University College London and a visiting professor in uh, different countries and uh, uh, a traveler, uh, uh, constant traveler. <laughs> so uh, thank you as well for coming to present improving energy efficiency via smart building energy management system, a comparison with policy measures. Well, thank you. Vous pouvez me écouter avec ça, ça marche, d'accord. So thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, whenever I come to Montreal, I always bring terrible weather. So I, I apologize for that next time. Yeah, exactly. Typical London weather. So, um, so yes, this is uh, 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 part of a, pr a project that I worked on for the, for the European Union over the past four years. Uh, I'll describe it in a little bit more detail because Pierre asked me to put things in, in some context. But uh, the essence of this work is about comparing uh, uh, more active use of, of uh, consumption of, of, of energy with policy measures that can be imposed from above. So policy measures are things that we were just talking about right now when uh, you get uh, a subsidy for making some upgrades to your building shell or uh, you are, uh, the government changes the tariffs to try to incentivize certain kind of behavior. Those are all meant to improve energy efficiency uh, or to reduce energy consumption in some way. Uh, and what we want to do is to take those traditional measures and compare them with smart building energy management system. Smart building en energy management system is able to uh, change dynamically the set point temperatures in, in, a, in a room or in a building in response to conditions either in the marketplace or uh, let's say the, the temperature or the solar insulation outside. So this is what we want to do. We want to see uh, how much um, more energy efficient can we get by having a smarter building energy management system, which does not require you to change the building's uh, envelope at all, just to do better with what you've got, make smarter decisions. So, and uh, this is joint work with uh, my postdoc, Paula Rocha, and uh, Michael Stedler, who's also uh, in between different positions. Anyway, so. Uh, just to put things in context, why are we focusing on buildings? Well, here's a simple uh, picture that indicates uh, that 40% of all energy consumption in the EU is used for buildings. Of this, two-thirds of the energy consumption is used for heating and cooling, which is uh, exactly what our project is focusing on. We're looking at uh, changing the set point temperature in a room to, change, to keep uh, comfort levels within a certain, certain zone. Uh, so we're fiddling around with the, with the heating and, and cooling uh, settings of, of, the, of the equipment. So we're trying to target uh, these two aspects here. And uh, in why, again, is this important? Well, if you can improve energy efficiency in buildings, you're going to go a long way towards meeting a lot of these uh, energy efficiency and uh, sustainability targets, which have been part of, the, uh, of, of European Union law uh, at least since 2009. So there was a directive that was passed. And in this, the EU set 20, 20, 20 targets by 2020. So they really like the number 20 for some reason. I don't know why. But uh, basically, they decided, OK, by the year 2020, we're going to meet three targets. One of them is we're going to uh, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 20% relative to 1990 levels. Uh, we're going to reduce energy consumption overall by 20% relative to 1990 levels. And we want 20% of all energy coming from renewables. Now, uh, this doesn't say anything about which sector of energy, because obviously now if you're going to have 20% of overall energy coming from renewables, uh, this means maybe you're going to move towards electric vehicles, which is then going to put more pressure on the power sector. So the power sector will have to see deep decarbonization by, by the year 2020. So what are the numbers achieved? You said, what's CA? Circa. C okay. oh, so this is, this is just a report that was made last year by some manufacturers association. And they're trying to see how far along are we uh, on the way to achieving these targets. And they said that, well, uh, this is going well. Greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you, they're, they're on track to, to reach this. Uh, there have been a lot of incentives to adopt uh, wind farms and, and, and photovoltaic panels in Spain. 
and also in, in, in Germany, uh, both of these technologies have taken off. So we're all on, on the way to meeting this 20% target. Uh, this one, reducing energy consumption, this one is, is quite mixed. So again, this, I'm saying that we're trying to tackle these critical areas where you have a lot of energy consumption in buildings, a lot of it is for heating, and energy consumption as a whole is not, the reduction is not going as well as meeting the other targets. So this is sort of what we're trying to, trying to focus on. I, I don't remember if they gave any numbers for this, but they had this nice graphic, so I thought I'd let the picture do the talking. Okay, so uh, this is the EU context. Uh, and this also fits in, to, uh, you know, in, in regards to a worldwide trend towards deregulation and decarbonization. Deregulation has been going on for over 30 years. Uh, Pierre Olivier was in Finland when this, a lot of this was taking on, and he did some of his PhD work on these areas where you're introduced, you're moving away from this regulated paradigm in which you had uh, mostly fixed tariff prices. And there was emphasis on central station generation. Uh, so basically, you had vertically integrated utilities in many areas, and they were responsible for all facets of, of, the, of the power sector, from generation to retail to distribution, uh, whatever. And this worked fine in, uh, as long as you did not require new technologies to be brought to the market, because these were basically regulated monopolies. They had their, they had their uh, profits essentially guaranteed. Uh, so they didn't really see the incentive to, to develop new technologies, to take a risk. So that was one of the reasons uh, that was quoted at, at anyway. I don't know if that was the real reason, but this is one of the reasons that's, get, that's been given uh, towards deregulating the power sector, to break up these monopolies, to have many different companies competing with each other, and then having the incentive to, to bring new technologies to the market. Uh, so after restructuring, we've seen uh, competition, obviously not perfect competition. You have oligopolistic markets at, at best. Uh, so there's exercise of market power and other issues. You have more volatile prices than you had before. Uh, again, this is uh, going to complicate the whole decision-making process because now you have to worry more about risk management before you could you know, take a largely deterministic approach to doing planning. Uh, if you're a power company. And also, within the last 10 years, uh, specifically, there's been a move towards decarbonization. Uh, these EU targets are just one, one example. In the US, you have uh, portfolio standards that say a certain percentage of energy has to come from renewables. Um, I don't know what measures you have in, in Canada. I think we were talking about it yesterday. You said there was no portfolio, but Quebec is now allowed to be part of the New England portfolio standard. So, there's obviously some kind of linkage. It's, it's hard, to, hard to escape that. Um, so uh, now there's a, a challenge at, at the building level because uh, as we have seen a trend towards uh, uh, trying to encourage more renewable energy technologies, a lot of these renewables, they're intermittent. So you can't predict very, uh, you, can't, you can predict reasonably well, but not perfectly well when wind is going to blow and therefore how much power there will be in the system. So you're introducing some sort of physical uncertainty on the supply side, and either you need to uh, have, uh, let's say, very flexible uh, supply side technologies, and you just can't have so many gas-fired power plants to back up all the, all the wind or so much hydropower to back up all the wind. You also need a countervailing measure on the demand side, which is more flexible demand. So this has been the desire the the desire towards uh, to to creating uh, smart grids which are able to be more responsive so you have more flexible demand that is able to alleviate a lot of these balance imbalances uh, due to uh, intermittent production so the vision is that rather than being passive buildings are supposed to become more responsive to market conditions so uh, they're supposed to be able to see what uh, what uh, prices are going to be like and then to adapt their, their, their behavior. But the problem is that uh, most building energy management systems, they rely on static set point temperatures. What this means is that usually a building manager says, um, okay, um, I want the temperature in this room or in this zone to be 21 degrees and that's where it's going to stay. Uh, because if I change it, then people are going to complain or, or uh, it's not good for, or, or there's some kind of regulation. They don't have the, uh, these building energy management systems, they don't have the flexibility to adapt to real-time real conditions. 
For example, prices might be changing or the temperature outside might be fluctuating. There might be different numbers of people in the room. You may not need to keep the set point temperature exactly at 21 degrees all the time. So unless you have some leeway in this, uh, it's going to be very hard for buildings to be able to have this flexible demand that is the vision that underpins this move towards smart grids. Um, and also, uh, building owners, they might lack the expertise to manage risk in the long term when they have to make retrofits to their buildings. Uh, I didn't mention this, but this is another uh, policy that's on the table in, in, in the EU, which is that uh, after 2020, a lot of buildings will have to be nearly zero net energy. That means that uh, it doesn't mean that you never use any energy. It means whatever energy you take in from the grid, you put back by, by producing energy during other times. So you sort of have balanced out. Uh, but if you're going to make such large refurbishments to the building, and now because the markets are deregulated, you're facing uncertain prices for energy and also for new technologies. If you're a building owner, how are you supposed to uh, make all of these decisions? And, and you're exposing yourself to a lot of risk. So it's with these two dilemmas in mind. One is to have uh, more dynamic set point temperatures, and second, to have better uh, facilities for risk management that we made this proposal uh, for an EU project four years ago, which is called ENRIMA, Energy Efficiency and Risk Management in Public Buildings. And this is the, the main concept of it, which is to take information on uh, different kinds of buildings, what kinds of loads they have, uh, their external features, uh, collect data on, uh, uh, on prices in the area and weather, uh, and from these collected data to generate some scenarios for the future, using these scenarios, come up with a decision support system uh, that's basically uh, a, um, a stochastic, uh, stochastic optimization model that's going to tell you which technologies to adopt, how to run them in order to manage risk or, uh, or to uh, uh, minimize your expected cost. So that's one element of this uh, project. The other element is to study the energy flows in more detail so that we can examine what are the impacts of changing uh, the set point temperatures. So then we would have these two models or two modules basically uh, sitting inside this decision support system and uh, use a graphical user interface and plug everything together with the building sensors and the building's current energy management system and offer it as a decision support tool to building owners and managers. So they don't need to know anything about risk management or optimization or uh, or um, thermodynamics of, of energy flows in buildings. They just need to have a nice, easy to use interface and they can enter the data for their buildings. They can enter the desired temperatures that they want. They can enter their preferences for, for risk and other things. And this decision support system will give them strategies to follow to meet those targets. So this is the, that's essentially the scope of the project. And underlying it are these two decision support system modules. One of them is this strategic module. This is for long-term uh, decision making uh, in which you're trying to make investments or upgrades to your building in order to manage risk. So basically you have these strategic decision variables, which technologies to adopt and decommission, uh, how to retrofit the building. You might have some strategic constraints, uh, for example, uh, concerning uh, how much energy can be produced from, from different technologies. You might also have a representation of how the technologies are running. So you have some, some of these upper level energy balance constraints. Basically, they say that if you have some demand, the demand has to be met by different kinds of technologies or, or purchases from the market. Um, then we also have this operational module which is uh, uh, more focused on short-term decisions. So the strategic module looks at 10, 15 years ahead. What are you going to do with your building in, in, in the long term? The operational module is looking at what are you going to do in the next day? How are you going to run the installed equipment? So the operational module takes all of the um, investments that you may have made in the past as parameters. So you can't change them anymore. The building systems are fixed, but now you go deeper, you go, you go deeper into modeling these energy balance constraints and say, where does the energy demand come from? What is it related to? So how can we model that to have these lower level energy balance constraints uh, and correspondingly 
lower level operational decision variables, such as what should be the set points on the equipment, how to operate the different equipment, and then connect these together with uh, the energy sourcing decisions. So this is what's happening inside the building, and then it's related to obviously to where you're getting the fuel from, from outside the building. So we want to connect those two. So we came up with these two, uh, two modules that have different scopes, but they do have some overlap. Okay, so essentially, um, uh, just to put this in context in terms of the research, uh, distributed generation investment and operations has uh, traditionally tried to take these conventional least cost methods from operations research. Uh, Hobbs provides a good summary and just adapt them to the building level. So what you do is you basically take, uh, so in this slide, this is a Sankey diagram. So here on the left hand side are the different sources of energy. So you could have uh, electricity that you buy from the grid. You have some different fuels like gas or whatever you buy from the gas company. On the right hand side, you have different end uses. So you might have electricity only. You have, uh, you have uh, refrigeration and building cool, uh, cooling. You might have heating and so forth. So the whole idea is how to allocate these resources to meet these demands. Right? So these are basically taken as parameters. You estimate what the demand for the building is going to be of different end uses. And you figure out, I have these different resources. I can buy electricity or natural gas from the grid. Or I can also have on-site generation like uh, combined heat and power technologies, uh, electricity storage, heat storage, and then uh, see how to allocate resources to meet these demands at minimum cost. So electricity is pretty straightforward. For example, you can just buy electricity from the grid and use that to meet your electricity demand. On the other hand, you can buy natural gas from the grid, burn it in the combined heat and power unit, which produces some electricity and meet electricity loads that way. Heat uh, demands are a little bit more complicated because heating you can, per you can meet by buying natural gas, burning it in the boiler, or you could be taking the heat that's given off by the combined heat and power unit, storing it, and then releasing it during the right time to meet your building's he heating uh, loads. So you can see that this becomes very complex. It's very difficult for, for you just to make some back of the envelope calculations if you're a building owner or even a, a facility a manager to, to match up the resources with the, with the loads. So that's why an optimization approach is needed. And, 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 and if, if you are not too concerned about where these demands are coming from, it should work fine for like a long-term planning model. So that's what uh, has been done. For example, there, these guys at Carnegie Mellon, they developed their microgrid customer engineering economic model. Uh, I worked with uh, people at Berkeley Lab to make the distributed energy resources customer adoption model. Uh, basically, we took these optimization approaches, scaled them down to the building level, accounted for these peculiarities at the building level, like having uh, uh, storage and, and this um, this cogeneration effect to illustrate that there are economic and environmental benefits from having these microgrids. Um, now, in terms of the, having an active demand response, we, I, I worked on this paper a few years ago in which we included demand response, but it was just another measure. Basically, all it did was, at a cost, you could reduce some of your demand. You basically shed some, some load or maybe uh, you made an investment in better insulation. You know, you might think about this for your house, but it was it was a bit abstract. It wasn't clear how you were reducing this demand. It was just like another resource you have in the bag. You pull it out, and then you say, "Okay, it, it, there's a trade-off, and here it's when it when it works." That somehow is not satisfactory to me, and not to other other project uh, partners when we were looking into actual buildings, because also if you're a building manager. You don't think in terms of, OK, tomorrow I'm going to need uh, 100 kilowatt hours of energy for heating. You think in terms of, uh, yeah, tomorrow I want to keep the temperature in the room within a certain range because you know, there will be people here during certain hours. So of course, you can make that connection. You can then simulate how energy flows in a building and then kind of turn those temperature requirements into energy requirements, but then it's a very static way of doing something. What we want to do is to do this in a dynamic way. So we have to forget about saying, I have a demand for heating, and say, I have a demand for comfort. And now I want to figure out what's the exact relationship, or an approximate relationship, and to develop a, sort of a thermodynamic model 
for converting these comfort requirements into energy requirements. So there have been some papers in recent years that have gone this quote unquote one level deeper. Uh, so uh, instead of demand for space heating or cooling being exogenous, it's now endogenous to the model. That means that we don't know at the beginning what the space heating demand is going to be. It's a decision variable and is determined within the model. So you have these comfort requirements and the set point temperature for your heating or cooling equipment is a decision variable. You determine it hour by hour as you go along. Uh, so uh, it's a richer operational model and it reflects the uh, thermodynamics of radiators. So that's what we did uh, with this guy Gro Gross book. Uh, we looked at radiators, uh, Liang, they looked at HVAC systems and tried to see how they interact with the building and so forth. So this is kind of I guess the state of the art in terms of modeling optimization at the, at the building level, uh, op in terms of optimizing uh, energy consumption at the building level. So what we are doing in this paper is now taking this smart BEMS that we developed and then comparing it with the traditional BEMS and giving the traditional BEMS, which has a static set point temperature, an added advantage. We're saying now you can also include policy measures that are on the table. So policy measures to change the tariff structure, to uh, allow uh, subsidies for adoption of new technologies. So we say, let's take this smart BEMS and see how it stacks up against policy enhanced traditional BEMS. And uh, we found, and we, and we used data from actual public buildings in Austria and Spain. So we looked at space heating for, for typical winter days. And we found that this smart BEMS usually outperform the traditional BEMS even when it was enhanced with favorable policy measures. And the reason for this is that uh, the traditional BEMS, uh, what, it, what it does is it's, it's not able to, re to respond in real time. It doesn't have the flexibility to adapt to changing conditions. So even if we take the traditional BEMS and we artificially change the set point temperature so that it's the lowest possible one that's allowed, even then it gets outperformed by the smart BEMS because the smart BEMS at times will strategically turn off the, the, the boiler and let the temperature drift by, taking, by using the solar gains and, uh, and, the, and the temperature outside that has been built up inside the building's shell. The uh, traditional BEMS is not able to, to do this, uh, at least not in a dynamic way. So uh, I'll, ex I'll show this in more detail, but this is the, the main insight. And the policy insight is that policymakers should address the demand side of this smart grid by uh, supporting uh, the integration of smart BEMS. Because one thing we encountered in this project was we weren't just supposed to do a study like this. We were actually supposed to go to the buildings and integrate the smart BEMS into the building. So actually, it's, it works now. What we have is we have added an additional layer of intelligence to the building's existing BEMS. So we're able to take data from the BEMS, send it to a server in Stockholm, run the optimization, taking also in data on weather and other conditions, write, send the results back to Austria, write it back to the building's energy management system, and change the set point temperatures of the, of the radiator. And you can do this uh, you know, from, uh, uh, from anywhere that, that you want, well, as long as you have access to the to this, to this, uh, to the BEMS, but the problem that we encountered was it was very difficult to actually uh, get our um, uh, our data to read and write with the uh, with, with with the building's existing energy energy management system, because the providers of BEMS they don't have any uh, requirement to make this open to the to the public, and clearly they they might see this as a uh, as as a unwanted competition. So we think that. Like policymakers, they have they required, um, let's say, uh, uh, in, in the PC market, they said that you can't uh, bundle certain kinds of, kinds of browsers with your software. They wanted to have an open, uh, open market. We think it should be the same thing here. If you want to move towards a smart grid, you should make it uh, compulsory for BEMS developers to at least allow uh, people who want to enhance the BEMS to customize it, to have a more responsive demand side, to enable people to do so. And it might be win-win. It might be that BEMS providers can offer this as a premium service. So right now there is no service, which means we had to hack, hack through this. But it shouldn't be that difficult. It should be something that could be provided. 
numerical example. So we take this model and we implement it on uh, for uh, for space heating for managing space heating demand basically during typical winter days at these two uh, public buildings in the EU. The first one is uh, Centro de Adultos La Arboleda in Sierra, Spain. It belongs to this organization called FASAD, which is a uh, foundation for uh, looking after uh, handicapped people. This is actually in northern Spain, so it's not as warm as you might think. Uh, they have reasonably cold winters, uh, so it's, I guess it's a maritime climate zone. Uh, this building, it has a conventional radiator and uses natural ventilation, so no HVAC system. And it runs the radiator by basically buying gas from the utility to run the boilers. It also has a CHP unit, but they don't use it very much. Uh, the other one is uh, Fachhochschule Burgenland, which is a technical college in Pinkerfeld, Austria. Uh, uh, and this is more of a continental climate. This is, I guess, in the foothills of the, of the Alps. So it's, they, have, they have proper winters. Uh, and they have a conventional radiator installed and an HVAC system for ventilation. Uh, like most of Austria, they have uh, the possibility to buy heat directly from the district heating supplier. So they, they're, not, they're not buying natural gas. Okay, so two kind of different kinds of buildings. Uh, and for each of these buildings, we assessed different policy scenarios uh, for the traditional building energy management system. For the Spanish site facade, we looked at the baseline scenario, which is how things are right now. So you have the equipment that's installed that I mentioned. You have some exogenous electricity demand, some exogenous domestic hot water demand. The space heating demand is now endogenous. You have this basically flat energy tariff uh, for electricity purchases, gas purchases. They get a feed-in tariff for electricity that comes from the, from the CHP. But uh, they said that they're, they're not using it for some reason. I don't know why. The second scenario is we say, OK, instead of scenario one, now the government imposes a carbon tax of 20 euros per ton. Let's see what that does. Does that give an incentive to reduce your energy consumption or not? How does it change behavior? Scenario three, uh, regulatory requirement that the zonal temperature cannot exceed 21 degrees if a conventional heating system is in place. So this is also something that's being mooted by the, by the Spanish government. And four, a uh, subsidy for installing a solar thermal unit. Uh, so instead of having to buy natural gas, now you can get uh, a lot of your energy for free for heating. Uh, similar policy scenarios for Pinkofeld. Uh, again, the baseline scenario is what they have in place right now. Uh, they also have a flat energy tariff. Uh, and you can see that they can buy heat directly from this provider at eight cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, scenario two is now they're put on a feed-in tariff. 18 cents per kilowatt hour, which incentivizes PV adoption. So you they decide to install a 100 kilowatt PV system. Uh, scenario three is uh, now the government changes to a time of use tariff. So now uh, there are going to be some higher tariffs during peak hours uh, for both, um, I guess, for both electricity and, and heating, at least for electricity, I think. And scenario four is uh, also uh, solar thermal uh, subsidy. So you can install a solar thermal system. So um, we implemented then these three cases. Uh, we had uh, smart BEMS, which is, which is our model, which we did only for scenario one by solving the problem in this, equation, by in this expression 25. So this is expression 25. That's the smart BEMS. Uh, traditional BEMS with mean static set point temperature. And we did it for each of the scenarios one through four. And we did this by changing equation, 20, equ equation two. Equation two was saying that the uh, internal zone temperature has to be between a certain range. And this is not how traditional building energy management systems operate. They take one temperature, and that's what they try to reach during every single hour that you specify. So we replaced that by saying the temperature in every hour has to be the average of what was specified. Uh, just when you say for scenario one, you solved it, is it for one day, one, one month? Yeah, for one, one day. So we solved it for uh, the 24 hours, one day ahead. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, uh, you, you, you can see that it doesn't take too long to do it for a day. 15 minutes for Pinkerfeld, 117 minutes for Facade. That's because for Facade, you've got this natural gas and other things going on. So it's a bit more complicated. But if you can do it like in, a, in an hour for a day, and then you're doing, let's say, a weekly 
weekly model. If, even if it takes four or five hours to run for a week, weekly model, it's OK, because you won't be running it every day. Um, so, OK, so that's the smart BEMS, traditional BEMS with mean static set point temperature, and then the static uh, and a, a traditional BEMS with a lower set point temperature, in which we just take the temperature in the zone and make it, uh, set it to the lower set point, uh, to, to the lower limit. Uh, obviously, this is a very highly nonlinear model. You can't solve it by hand, so we implement this in MATLAB, uses optimization toolbox, and like I said, uh, it runs reasonably uh, quickly for a one day ahead model for 24 hours. Okay, so let's look at some of the results. For the Spanish site, uh, this is a summary of the results for just the space heating alone. So you can see that we had these three cases. And for these two traditional cases, we also had these four policy scenarios. Uh, bottom line is, with the smart BEMS, you get a 30% reduction in the demand for space heating. Uh, and that's better than anything that you can do with the traditional BEMS, uh, even if you have these favorable policy measures. Okay, This one comes close, uh, but uh, everything else is, 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 is not effective, as effective. So we, let's try to see why that's happening. So let's first look at the input data. So here we have, for the 24 hours in a day, we have uh, the internal loads and we have the solar, uh, solar gains. So these are important because they're going to be driving how the set point temperatures are going to be uh, determined. So this is for the traditional BEMS with a, with a fixed mean temperature setting. So in this one, here we have the 24 hours in a day and this dark line is the external temperature. And then here we have um, the estimated uh, or the required zone temperature. So this is the temperature inside the building. So in most of those scenarios, we said, OK, this has to be let something around 20 degrees early in the morning. And then in the, uh, when, when people are awake and moving around, when they're occupying, it has to be 23, 24 degrees, something like that. And uh, faithfully, the um, uh, static uh, uh, or the uh, traditional building energy management system hits this target during every single hour. So that's what it does. Uh, you can lower this limit and say that now, okay, I want this to be something like 19 degrees uh, during these off-peak hours and uh, 22 degrees during the peak hours. And it can do that as well. But what our approach does is it takes advantage of this zone so this, it has these lower and upper limits. So on average, the temperature setting is going to be the same. But now you have the flexibility to allow the temperature to drift within this zone, uh, depending on what the external conditions are going to be like. So what's happening here is that for most of the time, you're sticking to the lower temperature limit. And then you get to this point where it's around noon time. And now the solar gains are starting to accumulate. There are more people in the room. Uh, the temperatures outside are increasing. So what this does is it optimally shuts off the heating system. And it allows the temperature to drift within the acceptable range until the late evening hours. It starts to get a little bit cold again. So now you fire up the, the heating system. And then maybe you turn it off again and allow it to drift. So you take advantage of the environmental conditions and coast off of those. And even though most of the time you're sticking to the lower temperature limits, you still outperform this building energy management system in which you're always sticking to the lower temperature limits because this one has no flexibility to respond to changing conditions. You can see this more clearly now if you actually look at the space heating demand hour by hour. So for these 24 hours, you have the dotted lines. So this is for the uh, fixed mean temperature setting. You can see that during certain hours, uh, for it, it's also optimal to turn off the, uh, the heating system. But for the smart building energy management system, it's always using less energy, and it's turning off the heating equipment for longer hours. Okay, so that's why it's able to save. And even more important is if you look at the profile of the natural ventilation. So with the uh, traditional building energy management systems, during the middle of the day, during precisely those hours that I mentioned, in which you have solar gains, high temperatures, many people in the room, it's actually becoming uncomfortably hot. So you have to start opening windows. 
So basically what's going on is not only are you using more energy for heating, but also a lot of that energy is literally going out the window when you have a static set point temperature because you can't adapt. On the other hand, look at the flat line with the smart building energy management system. It is able to fine tune the operations of the heating system so well that you don't waste anything. Nothing goes out the window. So that's where you are able to get 20, 30% savings. So it's not, it's not rocket science. That's, these are all well, <clears throat> results from your model. You yeah. haven't been able to actually implement the smart vents in the building. Or Good question. Yes, we did. So we didn't integrate it with the BEMS at the Spanish site, but we did integrate it with the BEMS at the Austrian site. And we had, as part of the project, because the EU is very insistent on seeing its money uh, going back to the public, they want to see this uh, decision support system being commercialized. One way to see it commercialized is to prove that this works. You're a skeptical uh, you know, uh, entrepreneur. Why would I want to put a million dollars on this? Well, we actually went and we had to hire independent energy auditors to verify that uh, demand for space heating is being reduced. So they could check with the, with the building's energy management system how much is being used. So yes, it actually works. For, not for this, we didn't do the audit for this site, but for the Austrian site, which had about 10% savings, and that was verified through an energy audit. So something is working. I can't, I can't prove without a doubt that it's always going to work like this. But. And do you have the results for the Austrian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go to the results for the Austrian side. So here's the results for the Austrian side. You can see you get about 9.6% savings. You have a lower savings than you did for the Spanish site because the Austrian site was uh, upgraded about uh, 12 years ago. The Spanish site was built in 1975 and has never been retrofitted. So I think that's why there is more scope for operational optimization at the Spanish site. But even at a reasonably modern building like Pinkofeld, we can attain uh, good, good savings, 10% without doing much. And in terms of cost, is that per day? Yeah. And how many days of winter would you have? I mean, similar days of winter. That's, that's a good question. I think uh, in the foothills of the Alps, maybe three to four months like that. Yeah, this was done for one of, yeah, I don't know which, which day exactly, but you can see the temperatures. You will laugh because this is like a mild day in Montreal. But, yeah, it's getting, it's getting cold. It's not, it's not the coldest day. So, um, yeah, so you have, again, this uh, with the static set point temperature setting. Again, you can't adapt. Um, you always have either that temperature between 20, around 21, or you lower it to have 19, but you're still outperformed by the smart building energy management system, which is able to uh, live off of this, uh, these solar gains and uh, adapt operations to the, the site. Um, here you can see that the scope for savings is less. The difference between the black line and the dotted lines is less drastic, but still there are hours when you are not uh, you don't have the heating system on with the smart building energy management system, but you do have it on with the traditional building energy management system. Uh, again, ventilation, you're using less ventilation, but still here during the middle of the day, you need to use uh, some ventilation even with the uh, smart building energy management system. Um, yeah, so again, there, uh, there, are, there is one policy scenario in which you get more savings in total energy uh, consumption, which is scenario four, which is the one where you gave away for free a solar thermal system to the building. And that's why it's basically not using that. It's not, it's, it's, it's not using any energy per se to meet the heating load. And that's the only case. And even in that, it's a difference of 0.5% in, in energy savings. So for most of the policy measures, uh, the smart building energy management system is doing better because of this flexibility. So just to summarize, uh, the big picture is that we're moving towards a power system, at least in Europe, in which you're going to have a lot more reliance on intermittent renewables. Uh, so it's going to add uncertainty to the supply side. This means that in order to, have, uh, to reduce the imbalances, you're also going to have a more responsive demand side. And this is coming in uh, as part of many different types of smart grid measures, not only 
smart buildings, but also electric vehicles, which you can think of as uh, mobile batteries. They're moving around and uh, charging and discharging, injecting and withdrawing energy at different locations. So that adds another dimension to the whole, to the whole picture. But anyway, we're looking at buildings. They're static, so it's easier to, to deal with them. Um, but one uh, problem is that they're, the way that their building energy management systems are set up, they're not made to be responsive to, uh, to these fluctuations in market conditions. So we develop an optimization model that tries to combine the traditional energy balance constraints with the equipment level thermodynamics and features of the building shell. Again, it's a first order approximation. It, it's maybe uh, not as good as what uh, somebody who is, who is in the field, a building engineer, would come up with. But then those guys would be solving differential equations. And I, I, I wouldn't want to try to do this within an optimization model as you're going along. Um, again, the idea is not to have the perfect model, but to have a model that's better than what building owners have at the moment. It doesn't have to even solve to optimality. As long as you can reduce the energy consumption relative to what they have, it's still an improvement. 10% energy uh, savings without doing anything, I think, is, is, is a good step. So, and, and you can also bring policy measures into the big mix. The traditional BEMs are not going to uh, deliver the energy savings that smart BEMs can, because basically all they're doing is uh, changing the way that you procure energy. They're not actually changing your incentive to reduce your energy consumption and to be responsive. Uh, so uh, we believe that the smart BEMS has the capability to, uh, to change these dynamic set point temperatures. Uh, and also, uh, it has lower capital costs because with all of these comparisons with the policy measures, I didn't take into account the cost of these solar thermal units or, uh, or, or PV units. We're just assuming that the government gives it to you for free. Uh, of course, they might, they might do that, but then there are going to be other costs. Uh, whereas with the smart BEMs, the only capital costs that we can think of are the cost of integrating your existing BEMs with this decision support system. And like we figured out in this four-year project, it's not trivial. That's why our policy recommendation is that as long as uh, there is this barrier, it's going to hinder the adoption of, of uh, these smart BEMs and the move towards uh, a more responsive demand side. So policymakers, they have done this with, they took on Microsoft, they made it mandatory so that if you buy a, a, a laptop or, or PC, you're not going to have all of these dif different software packages bundled in with Internet Explorer. You have, you have the choice to, to decide. And in the same way, BEMs providers should be forced to at least provide a service, a premium service, uh, for integrating uh, decision support modules on top of the existing uh, BEMs. And uh, this could be, this doesn't have to be seen as a threat. They can, they can uh, even uh, have a business model to make money off of this. So for future work, what we'd like to do is to look at uh, multiple zones. So right now we just looked at one zone. So basically I take this whole building and I model it as one zone, but that's not the case. You're going to have different rooms, different activities going on, and people will have different temperature requirements. So how to, how to deal with that. Uh, better treatment of the thermodynamics. Um, like I said, we tested this in a lab, and there were some discrepancies. We can try to improve on those. And finally, to uh, deal with uh, uncertainty in, in energy prices. So having and a nonlinear model with uncertainty, that, that would be uh, quite a challenge. But maybe we'd have to resort to some kind of simulation-based approach. But uh, those are directions for future work. And I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Uh... Um, I was just wondering, is that much? Well, it's not more amplified, it's just more um, did, did you uh, have the chance to, to look how could, this could be applied to North American? Ah, uh, uh, yeah, that's. And buildings, and you know, given that the conditions politically can be different and for the energy market. Uh, that's, that's, that's a good question. Um, actually, this, this model that we uh, started off with, uh, Durkham, where did it go? This one. Uh, this was actually developed in, in the US funded by the US Department of Energy. 
So actually, uh, kind of the seeds came from, from the US, uh, and, and specifically California. And this model has, I mean, I haven't been working on this directly for, for a few years now. I was working with the first versions. Now it's, it's being taken out to the, to the market. They have started to get at least uh, government bureaus to, uh, to use it for testing purposes, adopt it. Um, so, but this is coming from, from a different direction, you see. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure which kinds of issues are now going to be relevant in terms of uh, adapting what we have to the, to the North American market. Um, but I think a lot of the, the, the concerns are going to be similar. I mean, in, in, in California, you have uh, also a lot of deregulation that's taken place. There's a lot of scope for building owners to, to decide how they want to refurbish their, their shells and so forth and to, to change uh, their operations. Um, yes, yes, exactly. So there are incentives there in place. So. But the U.S. is so heterogeneous. You have some states that are even ahead of, of the EU in, with some uh, incentives and others that are just sitting back. So um, I think it's, it's a much more tricky, uh, tricky market to, to break into. In the EU, you have full support of the, of the European Commission. Mm -hmm. And even, even conservative governments in, in most countries, they, are, they don't try to deny that there is a need to, uh, to support these technologies. Would it be easy to model a summer day where you do a lot of air conditioning? Um, yes, well, you would essentially be using the HVAC system. So um, we haven't tested it out yet to use the HVAC for cooling, but we've used it for ventilation, so I think we could adapt it for, uh, for heating, for, sorry, cooling, yes. yes. Thanks a lot, it's very, very interesting. I was wondering, you, you applied it to model, to optimize the price, the cost? But uh, did you try to apply it to optimize the environmental impacts? I saw that you had this little equation that yeah, you said, well, yeah, we, yeah. we just use it for the cost. But did you try? No, we haven't implemented it for minimizing, let's say, emissions directly. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, but the thing is that uh, we did try to implement uh, carbon taxes. So in, indirectly, we were sort of addressing that. And it and doesn't make much of a difference because you need carbon taxes over 100 euros uh, to, to get to see any effects. And even right now, we tried 20 euros, and that's actually far above what is in the EU emissions trading system. So there's not much effect at the moment, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. How close are you to commercialization? Uh, we have we have evaluation agreements with certain with some companies, um, but yeah no I haven't received any money yet so that's I I check my mailbox every day and there are only bills in there and and emails for from students so I'm sorry but if you want do does anybody here want to buy this? But I mean would there be any incentive uh, for sorry like I mean because we're in Quebec right now and yeah. we're all uh, kind of talking about reforms and evaluation of our political uh, uh, energy strategy. I mean, you know, we have a market which is Hydro-Québec and it's pretty centrally planned. And yeah. So is there any value for applying this? That, uh, well, I mean, the value would come from not... And it's hydro. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the value would, would come from not, like, going door to door and asking single building owners or building managers if they would want to do this. It would come from... Uh, those who have who are big players in, in the energy market. So yes, it could be Hydro Quebec, but I don't know if Hydro Quebec deals directly with end use consumers or not. It does. Okay. Well, one of the one of the partners in, in the project is a Spanish power company, and uh, they see this as being potentially useful for their business because then then you say, well, hang on a minute, why is it? Why is it beneficial for a power company to have its co consumers reduce their energy consumption? Don't they want them to consume more and more and then make more money? Well, they think that by offering services like uh, advice on how to do retrofits, on how to do operational optimization, uh, they, can, uh, they can add more services to their whole kind of package that they offer. So it would, be, it would actually enhance them because now Basically, what, what they do is they take one form of energy and they convert it to another and they sell it on. Mm -hmm. And that could be very risky if the government decides 
to uh, to break them up or to make uh, to have a different kind of uh, business model. But now, if you diversify, you don't just you know sell fossil fuels, but also you provide services. And in in Spain, one of the ways to do this is to target the hotel sector because Spain is huge for tourism. Uh, and then if you if you are able to provide a service to the hotel industry collectively, then you will see an incentive to, to make these changes. Again, like uh, you, you've taught this course in, in China before, where you've said there's like this market failure where it's beneficial for society to do something as a whole, but not really worth it for individual decision makers to do it because they either will not be able to recover their costs or the savings are just not worth it. But now if you have a big company going in and they're able to make profits off of this, then it's, it's possible. There's not, I guess also what would be interesting, Pierre, you were talking that if we can uh, free up uh, more of the energy in Quebec and sell it at a yeah. more interesting cost to the US or Ontario, mm. this could be a way to manage our energy yeah. uh, in Quebec and then sell it for more interesting prices in other markets. We'll, we'll take uh, maybe two more questions uh, yeah. and then we'll close the session. Uh, my, my question is about uh, uh, energy efficiency implementation programs mm -hmm. and the market response. Do, do you think that we need more legislation or more incentive programs or more prices, I mean the higher prices? Well, I think we have a lot of legislation already on the table, and sometimes it sends conflicting signals, uh, and some of them are not credible. Like in Spain, they had a lot of uh, incentives for, for companies and even for individuals to adopt renewable energy technologies, uh, and so they ended up with, the, with, with this uh, glut of, of, of renewables. But now that the financial crisis hit, they're cutting it all back. So now you're left even with stranded assets. And in, in Germany, this was pushed through so much that now you don't have a transmission system that's capable of accommodating all of the, the wind, that's uh, wind farms that have, that have been built. So I think it's not about having more, it's about having, being able to foresee what are the consequences of certain policy measures. And I think to, to, to do that adequately, you need to have market models. So you need to have these kinds of oligopolistic models in which now you are able to see the connections between different sectors and the impacts of different policies. Um, and in terms of just at, at the building level, I think we need to have uh, a, a way to, for, for, uh, for building, uh, building owners to be able to adopt these smarter uh, energy management systems, whether it, it's, it's through higher prices or it's through removing the barriers to actually open up, uh, to opening up the, the, the BEMS. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure where, where the balance lies. Yes, I have a, a last question about the... I, I like the fact that it is dynamic, so you can follow in time the, the mm -hmm. demand in energy. Uh, and you can see when you are uh, consuming less energy. Yeah. Uh, did you think about how you could uh, match this with the type of energy production? For example, you know that solar uh, production uh, is uh, only during the day, that uh, yeah, uh, wind yeah. is probably during, sometimes are more uh, efficient in terms of uh, wind production. I mean, for, if you want to think about a big player like an energy producer, mm -hmm. maybe this type of information would be of interest to know what type of energy yeah. uh, I could play with, depending on the type of uh, energy uh, well, uh, benefits us. Uh, yeah, know. yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. And we actually wrestled with this because when we were going to calculate the primary energy consumption, mm -hmm. it was important to know which kind of uh, generating unit was, was marginal at, at the time, whether it was gas or coal or what. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I see this graph and maybe you can even identify what you are consuming like less at what moment. Yeah, but it's, 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 it's quite difficult to see you know, to track back the electrons back to some kind of power plant and then to see which power plant was sending them. It's if, if this is behind your model, yeah. you are supposed with your equation to know what you are consuming. Yeah, locally, locally we know. Locally we know, but then still a lot of energy is being bought, let's say, in the form of electricity, which okay. is just coming from the grid, and we don't know which power plant produced it. So we just use the average kind of primary energy conversion factor to, to do that. But yeah, you're right, for the, for the local production, you can, you can do it, and that's, that's a good point. We can try to, uh, to, to see where that energy is coming from. Yeah, good.
Thank you very much, Abzal, for coming here. Thank you. Let's thank Abzal for his uh, presentation. Very interesting, I think. Thank you.